Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Our Father, we stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful, so very grateful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to feast upon your word. I just ask that you would strip away all that which is foolish and ignorant and just seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We've been uh, studying together in the book of Romans, verse by verse, if you've been following us. And in our last study together, we were in the area of verse 15 of chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 15. I want to point out something, first of all, that these studies here that we're doing, they're not based upon the fact that truth comes from uh, blessedhopeforever.com. Nobody wants to know the truth any worse than I do, and, and no one is more convinced of our limitations as we feast upon the Word of God than I do. It is infinite. The, uh, the presuppositions that, that we have, and we all have them, they'll affect how we interpret these verses. And, and I've taken some time in the past trying to define certain terms, biblical uh, terms, redemption and salvation being two of them. You may have other opinions as to what those terms mean. The only thing that can come from my position here is that well, they're just my opinions as to what those terms mean. Uh, I spend my life trying to, to make sure that, if, if nothing else, that I'm, I'm consistent, that I'm not inconsistent in the conclusions that I reach on these studies. You folks are precious to me, and I have no, uh, I, I have every concern that I'll, I'll be honest with the text and not lead myself or anyone else astray. And these are, so these are my opinions. It doesn't mean that they're right. And it's my concern and my effort to exhort you to study on your own. There's absolutely no interest on my part of you agreeing with me. I've tried over and over again to point out that you shouldn't agree with something, uh, believe something that I believe just because I believe it to be true. But through the leading of the Holy Spirit, reach your own conclusions. Now, as we continue on uh, here through this chapter, this marvelous chapter, chapter 11, we have a multitude of terms in these verses that, that will make a great difference on the meaning that we may have, uh, have gleaned from this passage of Scripture. Uh, not just uh, biblical uh, terms, uh, strictly speaking, but even personal pronouns. And I've gone to great lengths to to try and, and make sure that I kept all of this straight and in order. Um, so let me at least remind you that, that we are in a context where that the subject has come up about the nation of Israel. Even though we are, the Gentiles are mentioned in this chapter. The 10th chapter ended with God pointing out that he had held out his hands all day long to a gainsaying people, and I pointed out that we're gainsaying in the original Greek is contradictive, contradicting, and one could reach the conclu you know, conclusion, well, uh, you know, uh, well, Israel didn't respond, you know, so he's going to, he's going to uh, cast away his people, he's going to destroy them, and he's going to try something else. And, the, and there are any number of Christians who look at God as, as some sort of a, a super scientist. In, you know, he's in the laboratory, 
And, you know, where he's like, well, I'll try this. You know, wow, that didn't work, so I'm going to try this. So now I'll try something else. I'll try something different. And in fact, I've heard many people say that God, you know, he tried innocence. Well, that didn't work. He tried law. You know, that didn't work. God tried something else and, and then something else and something else, and, and none of these worked. And folks, I don't see God as a uh, stumbling scientist trying one thing or another until he finds something that works. The God I see in the scriptures decided, and and really I don't even like the word decided because that the, that word decided sort of it assumes that he had other choices god determined and i believe every event has already been determined god isn't changing his mind and god isn't making up new ideas so i don't think that god is trying anything new let's look at at some of the terms what does it mean when he says the house of israel and what does it mean when he says the house of judah Jeremiah 31, 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Well, somebody ought to decide what those are. I try the best I can to assume that the language is literal. If I can't, then I try to look at the spiritual lesson in that. To me, it may be very simple, but I see the house of Israel as the northern kingdom, the house of Judah, the southern kingdom. Uh, you'll remember under Solomon, uh, uh, the king Solomon, a after Solomon died, the kingdom was divided, and people speak of the lost ten tribes. I, I tend to disagree w with that term. I don't think that there were lost ten tribes. They, uh, they knew what the tribes were in the days of Christ, but we did have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And in fact, Christ ministered to both. He was in Samaria and he, he was in Jerusalem. So a literal sense of that passage seems to me to say that he's going to make a new covenant with Israel and Judah. And he's going to put them together. And everyone from the least to the greatest will know the Lord and I say everyone because he uses the word all. I'm going to suggest to you that in my terms, uh, that hasn't happened yet. I do believe that the comment is prophetic. Now, I can read the various commentators on this. Having proven that God has no purpose in the nation of Israel, we know the house of Judah and the house of Israel represent the church. Well, I haven't concluded that God has no plan for the nation, Israel. That's a, that is a presupposition. They, of course, would, well, they'd argue that, well, it's not a, a, a presupposition. And they'd point out that all of the, the promises to Israel have been folded into the church. Behold, I tell you a mystery that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. So now we have a passage of scripture that says God has no purpose in the nation, Israel. And I think he does. I believe the chapter makes clear that he does. I reached the conclusion that God does have a strong purpose for the nation, Israel. So, you know, you can make the house of Israel and the house of Jacob the church. I think the house of Israel is the northern kingdom and the, and the house of Jacob is the southern kingdom. But the fact that I think that doesn't make it right. All I can tell you is, is that that fits best in my understanding of the scriptures. And then we have, of course, reference to Israel. We had the house of Israel and the house of Judah. We now have we now have, uh, we now have just the nation Israel. You can assume that that's the church, and and well, many do. Personally, I think it's the nation of Israel. A simple, straightforward statement that that's the nation of Israel. 
we have the, the, the word ethnos, where, where we get our word ethnicity, which is normally translated Gentiles. It could be translated nations. I think the term means the Gentile nations. It doesn't mean that it does, but that's what I think it means. We have also the terms first fruits and lump. Now, I've pointed this out, uh, I know, on numerous occasions. I don't think that we're looking at Paul's logic uh, at all here. I believe it's the Holy Spirit, and I believe the Holy Spirit had a precise purpose in why he said what he said. So we have to decide what he meant by first fruits, and what did he mean by the lump? The first fruits and the lump could be Abraham. It could mean that they're the Jewish nation. It could mean that they're elect Jews. If we make the first fruits and the lump both Abraham, what do we do with, with Adam and Enoch and Noah? Because surely, uh, there were those whom God had elected before he ever called Abraham. What we're looking at in the 11th chapter here, I believe, is God's dealings with Israel. Has God cast away his people, which he foreknew? Now, it'd be difficult to suggest that by that he means Noah or Adam. It wouldn't be difficult at, at all to conclude that he means the Jewish people, called out through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God forbid, may it never be, I'm an Israelite, the Holy Spirit has Paul say. So the context of the chapter is dealing with Israel. Therefore, it'd be, it'd be stretching the context, I believe, to suggest that the first fruits in the lump, you know, were Adam or Enoch or Noah or Methuselah or somebody else before Abraham was called out of, of, of Ur of the Chaldees. My personal opinion is that they represent Abraham. Now we come to the root. Well, the popular opinion there is that the root is Abraham. The less popular opinion is that the root is Christ, and you have to decide for yourself about that. I have difficulty seeing the root is Christ because I do not believe anybody in Christ is ever cast off. I'm absolutely persuaded we are looking principally at nations in this particular portion, this passage of Scripture, and that if you're in Christ, you're in Christ. You're not there because you did anything. You don't stay there because you do anything. You're there because he chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. He, by the voice of God, the command of God, made you righteous because Jesus Christ died in your place. And if Christ died in your place, it is inconceivable that you could die. That's a, that's a double payment. You know, we're suggesting that the, the almighty, eternal God in dying substitutionally for you wasn't enough. His death wasn't sufficient. And I can't do that. If I make the root Christ, I have to come up with another conclusion that I'm not sure is right. And that is that all of the branches that were broken off are, are put back in. And that, that may be. And that's something that, you know, you have to decide. We have the severity of God and we have the goodness of God in our context. It would look as though there were branches from that root that are cast off and that God was very severe toward those branches. There are those who suggest, yes, he was, but, but they will be put back in and that we're not talking about anybody losing their, their redemption in this context. And I think that's wrong. You could, you could speak of, of blessedhopeforever.com. You know, the Lord tarries. I go to sleep in Christ. Some other pastor continues on with this ministry. Uh, and in 50 years, well, you know, well, I doubt we wait that long. But in 50 years, 
you know, it may be vastly different. You know, where the, the, the first video of the week may be on what you need to do to, to bring more souls to Christ. And the second may be on, on helping the poor and doing good to your neighbor. And, and no comments at all about the person in the work of Jesus Christ. Much of modern Christianity, if I can use the term loosely, much of, of modern Christianity is love and peace and getting along and doing good and giving to the poor and on and on it goes. And, and folks, I am not opposed to any of those things. But first and foremost, Christian ministry involves the virgin birth of Jesus Christ and his substitutionary death for you. You don't have any, any problems finding any number of sermons or books or pamphlets telling you how to live with your wife, how to raise your kids, and, and how to invest your money, how to be a good Christian, you know, how to interfere with the government so that it's done on Christian principles, and, and on and on and on. You know, you can go, but you'll search far and wide for a serious, intelligent treatment of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and his substitutionary death. And if we all passed on and, and someone continued on with this ministry, I would be surprised, folks. I would. I'd be surprised if it if it continued strongly in the doctrine of the of the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ and the total depravity of man. I'd be greatly surprised. And so one could say that blessedhopeforever.com has been broken off. I believe we're looking at nations. I don't think the, the root is Christ because I have a problem with the casting off of some that were broken off. In verse 20, it does say, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Now, we have a, a problem you know, well, that maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the root is Christ. For example, why did Moses not go into the promised land? Well, the reason he didn't go into the promised land was because of unbelief. So one could say, well, there's a perfect illustration that one doesn't get into the peace and rest of Christ because of unbelief, but it doesn't mean that he's cast off. He was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Are you following, kind of following what I'm saying here. Well, we'd have to then, in that case, get 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 all of these natural branches back in. And we are told later that don't be surprised, he is able, God is able to graft the natural branches back in. And there are those who believe that's all of them. You know, that every natural branch that was broken off. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Every one of those natural branches that were broken off is grafted back in, so we can make the root Christ. And, and say that nobody, nobody is cast off of Christ. I have trouble doing that. I'm not persuaded that all of the natural branches that were broken off because of unbelief are grafted back in. I do, I, I, I can't help but uh, believe that the nation was broken off because of unbelief and God is able to bring the nation back in. But I don't think we're looking at individuals, and so I'm, I make the root Abraham. So there are those who believe the root is Christ, others who believe that the root is the whole nation of Israel. Many believe that the root is the early church, and many believe that the root are the first Jews who were redeemed. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the 12 tribes, and so on, and that's up to you. I'm not asking you to agree with me. I'm going to define the root in this context as Abraham. Now we have an olive tree. We know, of course, that, that Christ cursed the fig tree because it didn't bear fruit. There are those who believe the olive tree is the church. I believe the olive tree is Israel. That's up to you. We have a wild olive tree uh, and 
the same people that believe that the natural olive tree is the church believe the wild olive tree are the Gentiles. Wow, wait a minute. Okay. The, the wild olive tree are nations, but the good olive tree is the church, and I can't do that. If the wild olive tree are the Gentile nations, I don't, I don't see anything but consistency in, in concluding that the natural olive tree is the nation Israel. So I'm going to suggest to you that I believe the natural olive tree is Israel. We have natural branches broken off. We have wild branches grafted in. I don't think we have any question that the wild branches that are grafted in are, are Gentiles. Are they Gentile generations or Gentile nations? There are some who believe that all Gentile nations will be grafted in. And when that finally happens, we're going to have a, a term of the, uh, the, the term, the fullness of the Gentiles shortly. There are those who believe that the fullness of the Gentiles is every Gentile nation. And when we finally reach every Gentile nation, then the end will come. And they base that on the fact that essentially the context of this chapter is national. And so when they talk of the fullness of the Gentiles, they speak of every Gentile nation. You know, we'll get there in just a moment. Either the natural branches, I don't, I don't like the expression Jewish generations. I think the natural branches are the nation of Israel. And the nation Israel, as a nation, is cut off. If we conclude that God has no further plans for Israel nationally, well, then we're, we're through with that. But the interesting thing is we have a prophetic passage of Scripture here that says God is able to graft those, na those natural branches back in. And our text now goes on and speaks of the fullness of the Gentiles. I don't know what that means, but I can tell you what I think it means. The popular opinion is the fullness of the Gentiles is, is all of the elect Gentiles. And then there are others who believe the fullness of the Gentiles is every Gentile nation. You know, they simply say that, that whenever every nation has been reached for Christ, then the end will come. There are others who believe the fullness of the Gentiles is the end of this age. Jerusalem will be trodden underfoot until the times of the Gentiles be completed. Whether the times of the Gentiles and the fullness of the Gentiles are the same thing, I don't believe they are, but there are many who do. I think the times of the Gentiles are those times that God carefully uh, uh, delineated in Daniel and at the end of the Gentile domination is, is going to be the restoration of the, the nation, Israel. So to that degree, I'm a, I'm a millennialist, which puts me at odds, of course, absolutely at odds with the covenant position. I believe the fullness of the Gentiles is God reaching the Gentile elect. And then we have all Israel in this context. There are those who believe that all Israel is all elect Jews. There are others who believe that all Israel is every Jew living at the time Christ returns. And there are still others who believe that it is the nation of Israel. And there are others who believe that, that all Israel is the kingdom age. And that the last group believe that all Israel is every elect person from, well, it's every every single elect person from Adam until the end of the age. And there are more choices probably on all Israel than any of these other terms. For whatever it's worth, and I, and I guess I have to express an opinion, I believe it's an interesting term, but I think all Israel speaks of the nation of Israel, and I believe all Israel shall be delivered as it is written. Our last term now is... The, the term saved, and I've spent some time uh, differentiating, I believe, the, the difference between the two words, uh, redemption and salvation, uh, and uh, many of you who are just now listening to this video, uh, you may not be familiar with how that we are to distinguish between these terms, 
Uh, I've spent some time talking about that, and I've, I've received questions on that, and I've been asked to expound on that, and I've tried to do that. Uh, because the term saved, the word save, uh, saved, salvation, whatever, however, the word sozo, in all of its uh, different, uh, all the derivatives, all the different forms, seems to present a problem to a lot of people. I don't know whether these verses will help or whether we should even spend time on it. Uh, uh, I, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on that to, to lengthen this video, but I will read through these verses. And so all Israel shall be saved, and the normal reading of that is that all Israel shall be redeemed. That's the normal conclusion reached by, you know, just almost anyone. Now, I'm going to read through these verses. I, I don't know, you know, whether you want the references or not. If you want to, you know, these references, just email me. I'd be happy to send them to you. You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. So you have to endure to the end to be redeemed. Now, I don't think very many of you, at least those of you who follow this channel, would agree with that. You know I don't. Enduring to the end is not the, the basis of redemption. Except the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, those, uh, you know, are the redeemed ones. He shortened the days, so the saved can't be redeemed in that context. And with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this generation, well, surely he doesn't mean redeem. You wouldn't read redeemed in, in that. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, perceived that he had faith to be saved. Well, surely he didn't have faith to be redeemed. That would contradict a whole body of Scripture. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath, well, clearly, saved there doesn't mean redeemed. We are justified and then saved. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being now reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. No one would read redeemed in that. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. I don't believe you're re redeemed by hope that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, maybe you do believe that that is the basis of redemption. I do not. The basis of redemption is the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. And Christ did not die in my place. I was not redeemed because I confessed with my mouth and believed in my heart. But I am saved delivered when I do that. And that is the context. He's talking to redeemed people, folks. For after that and the wisdom of God, the world uh, by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Any number of people read that as uh, redeemed, that you were redeemed by preaching. Once again, I believe you are redeemed by the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Substitutionary, in your place. And then, of course, uh, there's the husband and the wife not knowing whether they'll save one another. That's, that's not redeemed. And then the, one of my favorite verses, the, you know, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine continue in this, for in doing this thou shalt save, that is, deliver thyself and them that hear thee. That's not talking about redemption. Nobody could, could conceivably read redemption in there, and yet many do. You're not redeemed because you continue in doctrine. Wherefore he is able to save them to the utmost, the uttermost, that come unto God by him. Now, 
many people say, see, you've got to come to God in order to be saved. I, I agree with that, but I do not agree that you come to God to be redeemed. You come to God because you are redeemed. And then there's uh, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your life. Again, it defies imagination that that could mean redemption. In that context, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Once again, we wouldn't say that the prayer of faith redeemed the sick. And if the righteous uh, are scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly in the sinner appear? Well, if they're righteous, they're already redeemed. If the righteous uh, be saved with great difficulty, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now, those are just some texts I wrote down. There are many others, many others, folks. Many that would seem to suggest that we are not being honest with the Word of God to always read redemption into the word sozo, delivered. This is what I've been trying to point out time and time again. I don't think I've done a very good job of that. Uh, people continue to write me. They seem to have more confusion about it than I had hoped. To me, it's, it's just a clear-cut distinction, folks. It all depends on context. Just look at the context. So, all of Israel is going to be delivered and, and and I believe all Israel is the nation of Israel. My prayer for all of you folks is that you will eagerly and zealously dig into the scriptures to determine for yourself what God is saying in this context and in any context that you look at. I want to thank you all for your kind and, and generous comments, your support, your continued prayers for this ministry and your prayers for the heartland as we continue to deal with the unprecedented storms and the flooding that's occurred across the region. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.